Well, now we've heard it from both the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. Austerity is over. It's a nice thought, but I think it will be down to our constituents and those out with this place to decide whether or not they've achieved it. Every week, I meet people whose lives have been and are still being damaged by austerity. And today, they, like us, have been told exactly what it is that this government means when they tell us it is over. And right now, people up and down the country will be working out the impact of this budget on their income, their food bills, and whether it means they've reached the light at the end of that dark tunnel that began with the financial crash now more than a decade ago, in 2008. I suspect they'll be disappointed, disappointed as we are, to be promised growth at less than 2% for five years. And with Brexit weighing down the economy and the big issues that haven't been tackled, today's budget doesn't fulfil even the minimal definition of ending austerity as laid out by the IFS. That would cost £19 billion a year on top of the government's NHS commitment. Instead of that, we got more for potholes than for schools. Nothing for women born in the 1950s and facing pension inequality, and a pathetic inadequate sticking plaster for universal credit. So much more should be possible, could be possible, but for Brexit. And just think, that 500 million which the Chancellor today added on to the 3 billion which has previously been allocated for no deal preparations. What could that have done for our public services? What we needed today was vision, renewal, and a way to reboot not just our beleaguered economy, but our damaged society. But instead, we got that sticking plaster. And by March, if some of the Chancellor's Brexiteer buddies have their way, this plan may all have to be torn up and a fresh fag packet found to write a new one on. This autumn, we are undoubtedly seeing short-term improvements in the economic picture, but there are still worrying trends that the government has failed to tackle. Its own independent advisory body, the Office of Budget Responsibility, has warned that the whole period of Brexit negotiations is so disastrous and clouded in uncertainty that it's unable to assess the impact. What thought that is? We're faced with so much ambiguity and the threat of chaos looms so large that the body whose one role is to assess the economy is unable to do so. And while the government suddenly seems to have discovered £13 billion from somewhere, we all know that finding some money down the back of the sofa may well help with Christmas, but it won't pay the bills for the coming year. What we don't need now is a quick fix for the short term, a slapdash cover-up job. Today, the country needed a Chancellor who would lay out how we will go about repairing the severe damage that austerity has done. One who will fix our broken tax system. Most important of all, one who will find a way to restore a social contract that many struggling at the lower end of the income scale feel has been thrown on the fire, along with their ambitions for their future and for their family's future. The very people the Prime Minister promised to support in her first statement on the steps of Downing Street are still waiting for the fulfilment of that commitment. What we need now is a people's budget that lays out a progressive way ahead for the 21st century. A budget that protects the economy by allowing a people's vote on the final deal with the EU, allowing them to opt for an exit from Brexit. We need a budget that fixes our broken tax system to boost investment and ensure the wealthiest individuals and big businesses pay their fair share. A budget that invests this money, the money in communities by reversing school cuts, putting more police on the streets and properly funding universal credit. Yes, properly funding. In order to see an end to austerity, we would need that cash injection of £19 billion and universal credit would need £3 billion pounds, instead of £1 billion over five years. In 1909, Lloyd George laid the foundations of what became the welfare state in his budget and wrote the first page of the modern social contract with the introduction of employment insurance. 
And yet, a century later, universal credit, the descendant of that policy, is again at the heart of the change that we needed today in this budget. We all know that it's almost unique amongst government policies, and it has nearly universal support for the original principle of simplifying benefits and helping people get back into work. But condemnation for how this policy has been implemented is almost as widespread. In my constituency of Edinburgh West, we will see universal credit rolled out for the first time next month and we're braced for its impact. Experience elsewhere tells us to expect people having to wait weeks longer than expected for payments, problems with rent arrears because of late payments, people facing increased stress, mental health issues and so much more. But it could have been avoided if the rollout was paused to fix the problems. And the Chancellor had announced that he was reinvesting the £3 billion which was taken out of the system. Reinvesting that money would allow people to earn more before the benefits are reduced, something the Joseph Rowntree Foundation has said would make a difference. Instead, we got that £1 billion over five years. But elsewhere, our public services need investment, and this should come from reforming our tax system so that it fairly taxes wealth and not just income. If the Chancellor had grasped that nettle today, he could have begun the process of healing the country and really ending austerity. But once again, he simply put off the day when we all pay the price of that broken social contract. The way things are now are not how they have to be. And the Liberal Democrats are demanding better than this.